Okay, well, um, first of all, um, I want to thank the organisers for having me. And um, hello, based on whatever your time zone is. Um, today, I'm going to present a paper that I've been working on uh, that's called User-Generated Content and the Aesthetics of Enclosed Creativity. I'm currently in the middle of a big rewrite of the paper. I got a very well-deserved savaging by reviewer number two. Um, and I'm also pre preparing an empirical study um, based on the same topics. So I'd really appreciate any constructive criticism or feedback um, if we have time. It's very welcome. Okay, now if I change slides with this mouse, we'll do it. Uh, no. Okay, sorry, just give me a sec. The slide changing does not happen. There we go. Okay. My research is um, based on the motivation that um, user-generated content and the model of Web 2.0 is transforming our relationship to creative software and producing aesthetic outcomes that often evade the spotlight of art historians. I'm particularly interested in works made inside game engines, but specifically the works made inside creative game sandboxes. These works are often harder to see because they're sort of enclosed within proprietary game systems, but also they don't really fit the proximal art historical categories like net art or post-internet art. And while these labels work often very well to define works made specifically um, within the context or economy of the art world, they don't really encompass the enormous amount of creative energy that's currently being uploaded into places like modding repositories and game sandboxes. So I sort of take a sidestep past the Duchampian paradigm, looking at things that have already been designated as artworks. And instead, I'm looking at um, game mods as simply a significant form of creative practice, whose relationship to innovations in software, software development and platform capitalism might make these works really quite relevant um, for contemporary aesthetic scholarship. When I refer to game modification as an example of enclosed creativity, I'm talking about how the aesthetic significance of these works is determined by the limitations of the software environment and the particular technical, social and legal parameters that define these environments from uh, patterns of community evaluation to the wording and enforcement of life, license agreements and uh, terms of use agreements. To explain what I've worked out so far in my research, I'm going to divide the presentation into three parts. The first part describes the paradigm that I'm observing of enclosed creativity within the general rise of software-based creation and user-generated content. The second describes the main factors that shape this paradigm, how the technical history of modding and machinima informs the latest software systems, and how the legal restrictions imposed by software can only really be understood alongside the way that they're renegotiated based on the demands of users, what Lawrence Lessig refers to as the media hybrid. And the third part of the presentation describes the aesthetic features that I've identified so far in my case study research. Uh, art and media scholars in the room will probably notice that my analysis reproduces the general structure of various contemporary aesthetic approaches. Um, I examine the biographical features of the work, its relational at attributes, and the spatio-temporal presentation of the work. Uh, this is directly informed by uh, Tracy Harwood's use of Megan Wingett's representational model to study mods, and I also add in other texts like Hiroki Izuma's uh, database aesthetics as key reference points. So the paradigm of the research, what are the observations that motivated me to do a study like this? Computer game modification is in my field. Um, my background is as a visual artist, a game scholar, and an art historian, and I work and teach with 3D graphics and computer game technologies. For the art historian, the scale of creative activity in modding is astonishing. Uh, the creative sandbox game Gary's Mod sold over 15 million copies and still has a daily average of around 50,000 concurrent players. Minecraft sold 69 million copies and has a daily average of over 700,000 players. And the newly released Creative Game Toolkit, or Interactive World Dreams, had over 21,000 players and 35,000 player creations within the first six months of release. 
So these numbers can't directly correlate to quantities of aesthetic masterpieces, but I think the scale of use multiplied by the creative basis of these software suggests that um, there might be some pretty great stuff to study. Second, the software being used for this large scale creative activity is a really good example of the intersection of software studies and platform studies. As software, modding typically operates at a high level of the graphical user interface, where sophisticated operations can be achieved with very user-friendly tools that are built to encourage non-specialist experimentation. In the case of Media Molecules Dreams, where I've been most of my uh, more recent case study research, we have a 3D sculpting and game programming interface that can be used by children. And it's also one of the first 3D editors and game engines based on voxel graphics, which itself is a huge technical milestone. At the same time, we have a system where all of the creations are essentially dependent on the platform itself to run, therefore enclosing everything that's made within the software tool itself. And third, modding offers an important example of contemporary authorship models. Um, unlike contemporary arts, fetishization of the individual artist, modding, much like software development, retains a degree of iterative and collaborative authorship when modded, downloaded, tested and expanded by other players, but at the same time uh, defined by a continued debate over the commercial status of these activities. Uh, Daniel James Joseph described how the decision of modders to reject a mod marketplace essentially vindicated what Tiziana Terranova and Seth Giddings also described as a sort of potlatch online economy where surplus, surplus creative labor is ritualistically donated despite the fact that it's simultaneously being commercialized by game companies. So to summarize the, the paradigm motivating my research, this, the stunning range of creative modes and their position at the intersection of software-based creativity and distributed authorship models became a creative paradigm that I found myself really interested in studying. And based on this initial groundwork, I moved on to examine some of the fundamental factors that shape the creative works found in game sandboxes. First, with modding, we're looking at a creative industry that's sandwiched somewhere between game development and game play, or at least game usage, somewhere between artistic production and surfing web 2.0. The origins of game modding and machinima lie in the enthusiasm of game fans to extend the universe of the game, such as Doom in the 90s, and the strategic insight of game developers who realized that encouraging user-generated content could dramatically extend the shelf life and profitability of their products. Game modding represents a peculiar sharing of proprietary technology where the fans desire to extend the universe or a player's desire to play with the game itself collides with a profit motive where these tools are bundled into the games themselves. Second, this vague territory between developing and playing can't be cleanly read as simply the oppression of modders at the hands of evil developers. Uh, legal case study analysis by Lawrence Lessig and Christina Hayes demonstrates that whilst game license agreements always contain hyperbolic claims of company ownership over user creations, in practice, these legal arrangements tend to collide with a lot of pushback from users and at the end of the day, the companies must retain the user base in order for the platform to survive. And so across many examples from the Potter Wars to Blizzard's letter to the machinimator, machinimators of the world, Lessig and Hades demonstrate that the enclosure of creativity is marked by a very vague and esoteric property boundary, defined by the need for corporations to protect their intellectual property colliding with the remixing practices of the users on whom they commercially depend. This kind of collision of copyright enforcement with user behavior is a fundamentally important aesthetic consideration for understanding contemporary culture. And another reason why an aesthetic study of mods um, should yield some interesting results. What um, Manovich and Azuma describe as database aesthetics in action legal constraints of proprietary game software, modding demonstrates the spread of what Azuma described in the Japanese otaku of the 1990s, engagement based on esoteric obsessions with threads of cultural fandom. And for a moment, in game modding, we observe attempts to engage with the world as a database, a geopolitical totality that's too large to represent 
but that can be revealed when culture is remixed through the individual actions of a database query, a cultural search, and then an act of reinvestment, an upload or a remix. But um, Boria described as post-production culture is also highly applicable to the aesthetic strategies that we see in the work of game models. So, so far in my research, my aesthetic analysis has focused on creative game sandboxes, and in particular, um, Media Molecules Dreams. Analysis has been hermeneutic, and based on this, I've derived three tentative aesthetic features of enclosed creativity. I'm currently revising these work and these labels might change, but here's what I've concluded so far. Three uh, aesthetic features of enclosed creativity. Uh, they are claustrophobia, repetition, and redundancy. Claustrophobia, I find in two forms, in the software itself and in the database model. The software is that you have to work really hard to overcome the default visual characteristics of most platforms. Much like a cliched Photoshop filter, game sandboxes tend to return their own operating logic in the works that we make. Then warehouses our creations. Proprietary creative software like Photoshop or Maya are usually built to contain their own creations rather than to export them into generic exchangeable file types. Astrophobia is in the database itself. The model of game sandboxes, moving through the library of user creations is very claustrophobic. Sony's dream sharing menu provides me with a scrolling list of recommendations, iterating and reflecting a filter bubble of memes and trends based on my previous searches and the games I've played, grounded by iterations of my own tastes and preferences. Feature is repetition. Broadly in ritual and the reproduction of cultural traditions. At his phrase, database animals, from how the Japanese otaku navigate the cultural database that they live in. Rajev imagined art after the end of history. Libraries of mods, I encountered the same recreations of SpongeBob and Shrek memes alongside the same recreations of modding discourse, iterated again and again. Trump Zelda remix, I read another boundary dispute between Nintendo and Sony. The box is released with a new set of user rules. It's as if the lawyers already know that the first thing players will do is recreate familiar cultural fragments, therefore setting the lawsuit in motion. Themselves, the new platform and its lawsuits then spark the reconstruction of debates surrounding monetized mods, creative labor, and the internet potlatch. Repetition emerges as an aesthetic feature. Which I identify so far as redundancy. As to the ephemeral nature of creations in game sandboxes. Very vulnerable to redundancy, much more than other types of software. Being updated, proprietary file types become increasingly cumbersome to do any of the heavy lifting. Alternatives are regularly shut down as was the case with Trixel's Little Big Planet remake. I believe historically balanced by repetition. Dual works are vulnerable and dependent on the survival of the platform. Avery of Modders predicts that works are bound to be recreated as the opening act performed on every new platform. Um, this concludes my presentation, hopefully where we've got plenty of time. Um, I began this research as hat on motivated to contribute to the aesthetic study of mods. As I mentioned, I'm currently undergoing a major rewrite um, and I'm also applying to do some empirical research to test these hermeneutic claims and to test these observations of claustrophobia, repetition and redundancy as the enclosed, as the aesthetic features of enclosed creativity. So whilst time is limited, I'm super happy to take questions and um, excited for any feedback that will help me develop this further. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any questions here, but it might be 
a good moment to sum up your bio because you jumped into your presentation before we got a chance to do so. Dr. <laughs> Peter Nelson is a art historian, game scholar, visual artist, and he's working at the intersection of computer games and landscape studies. He's a professor at the Academy of Visual Arts and Augmented, at the, uh, and Augmented Creativity Lab at Hong Kong Baptist University. He is researching player-generated content and landscape encoding using generative adversarial networks and the ontology of the digital image. 